KSQD Santa Cruz. Stay tuned for an extra special second part of Talk of the Bay with your host, Amy Chen Mills, as we set things up. Stay tuned to KSQD. The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Talk of the Bay Part 2. I'm your host, Amy Chen Mills, and we are doing another election season special, if we can handle it. Can you all handle it, folks? I can handle it. (laughs) Do we have election fatigue? I saw Don Lane say he had election fatigue. How are you guys doing? Oh, I'm psyched. Okay, people are psyched. So let let me tell you who is here. We have Joy Schenle-Decker, who is candidate for mayor, running against Fred Keeley, who was here last week on the show with us on climate and city growth and development, as well as city policy in general. What can we do around the climate crisis? Um, Joy is a community organizer, artist, and parent living in the west side of Santa Cruz. She is a member of the Working Families Party. Democratic Socialists of America, Santa Cruz, and on the Organizing Committee of Sanitation for the People and Santa Cruz Cares. While raising her children, Joyce stayed involved in civic life, including two years of service on the local primary school board of governors while living in London. Working from a justice-based ethos to improve life for those at the bottom will improve quality of life for all of us in Santa Cruz, she says on her website. With trickle-up policies, we, we will have less poverty, with fewer crimes of desperation. We will have less fear and more connection. We have the resources to take care of each other. We just need to make decisions that will get us there with protections for the precarious, progressive taxation, and reallocation of funds. Thank you for joining us, Joy. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, we also have in studio with us uh, Bacha Kagan. Bacha is actually a dear friend of mine and the partner of Michael Levy, who was on last week. And there's a reason that she's here, because she knows so much about the climate crisis and about, uh, I think, what needs to be done at this time. Bacha Kagan has a bachelor's degree in agroecology and a master's in clinical psychology. She has been an environmental educator and climate activist for over 20 years. Her input was solicited and included in the original climate action plan for the city of Santa Cruz when part of a group called Local Solutions to Global Problems. So you were part of that group, Bacha, right? That's correct. Yeah. She has been employed to restore sand and gravel mines in Santa Cruz County, has been a farmer, and worked as an assistant planner for the county's resource recovery program. I know you were also at a COP. Were you at the COP26 in Paris? That's right. I was there, yeah. Yeah. What was your role there, Bacha? Well, I was there to help climate activists have a place to um, deal with their feelings that were coming up at the climate summit because it was clearly, um, it clearly stirred up a lot of thoughts, feelings that people needed to be able to vent and think about so that they could go clearly into the summit. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Sure. And I know you were also protesting Line 3 in Minnesota recently. <laughs> That's right. A year ago or six yeah. months ago. Yeah. Um, and Linda Marin is joining us via Clean Feed. Linda, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Linda has been one of the foremost climate activists also in this community. Uh, Linda retired from teaching at UCSC over 20 years ago, but continues her lifelong anti-nuclear weapons and climate activism. She heads up the Santa Cruz chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby and meets with numerous other climate justice organizations, including Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, the Climate Alliance, the Santa Cruz Climate Justice Crew, of which I am also a part, a Youth for Climate Justice, and she is on the board of the Fund for Nonviolence, a locally based organization that focuses on reimagining public safety, reparations, accountability, and healing. She is also a member of Singing Wood, which you may have seen around town or on West Cliff Drive recently, a marimba band that plays traditional music of the Shona people of Zimbabwe. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining us. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, so... 
I um, on the last show we covered a lot of things and people called in and it was we were a little bit all over the place, uh, which is what happens when you have a lot of people here. And I couldn't reduce the numbers for this uh, show because we had to make it equal for for Fred, you know, because Fred is also running for mayor. Uh, but I want to try to articulate kind of what I'm going for on this show and the reason I had a Bacha joining us and Linda too. And that is that it feels to me when I was running for office, for example, that we, we really aren't embracing the reality of the climate crisis. And what I mean by that is we may be somewhat comfortable still here in Santa Cruz, but not totally. We lost 920 homes in the CZU complex fires. The state is looking at drought. Uh, I mean, the Mississippi River is drying up. Uh, cargo ships full of food can't get down the river to go out to other countries. Think about if that's going to get better or if that's going to get worse as the climate crisis intensifies. So what's happened, and then also if you think about Somalia, where they are, where they are starting to starve to death and run out of drinking water, um, we can say that collapse in some ways has already happened in parts of the world. And we happen to live in an industrialized sort of developed society where we're, it, may, it may hit us later, but we can also say it's hitting us now if Lake Mead is drying up. Um, and so we got a little bit into talking about our feelings about it on the last show, but I mean, my feelings are my feelings and I process them in the way that I do and we all should figure out a way to process them and then also act and act according to the reality of the crisis. Um, would you, I would like for the climate activist, Bacha, maybe you first and then Linda, to speak to where you think we are. Not so much about hope or optimism, but, you know, where are we, Bacha? Well, I mean, I think you pretty much said it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe we don't need to add to that. Um, yeah, I mean, we have... I'm really worried about the city of Santa Cruz because we are in a floodplain. And yes, we're in a drought right now. Right. But the actual climate adaptation plan for the city says that we have to move all this infrastructure, our sewage treatment plant, our, our sewer system, our, our electrical system. Everything has to move uphill in case of, you know, ocean rising which right. is gonna happen right so instead we're building buildings which seems a little crazy to me but anyway that's just me <laughs> <laughs> i don't this and this is how i kind of feel and i wonder how you feel like we are on the titanic and we're bickering about should we add more seats to the buffet room or something like yes right. maybe i mean maybe we should i don't know this is when you get into really the real politic of santa cruz like we can't we we must probably build affordable housing uh, but, Linda, what do you think about the reality of where we are and where our city politics are? And I know you've both looked at the—I believe you both have looked at the cl city's climate action plan. I have um, recently. Uh, Linda, what do you think about where this, what the city, where the city is in our sort of mentality and wh where we are in climate reality? Well, I'm going to back up and say something um, that's parallel. Okay. <laughs> but but it, but relates. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and that is that when I was doing get out the vote work on um, sat Sunday in front of Patagonia. Yeah. Um, their big sale and there was lots of people. And one of the persons that I spoke to there, um, when we were asking people, well, how do you feel about climate right now? Um, and a young man, like a college student, said, oh, it's terrible, like we're screwed, only he said even a more, um, you know. Colorful <laughs> word. word. <laughs> Colorful word. <laughs> and, um, and then I said, so what are we going to do? Um, and he said, you know, the problem is we know how screwed we are, but we're not willing to give up anything in order yeah. mm. to make it change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that, and then he and I both had this cognitive dissonance moment of staring each other in the eyes, recognizing that that was a real possibility, and um, and having it not be acceptable. And yet there it was, a possibility that that's the way we're going. Um, so about 
the city plan and the county plan, because there's also a county, Santa Cruz County Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, which is now in the works. Yes, um, it's supposed to come out by the end of the year, I believe. Right. And that numbers of us put uh, had input to. Um, and there is a lot of talk about wanting to match the degree of urgency that people are feeling. And yet, I think we're all struggling to make those plans look like reality as we are perceiving it. So, um, you know, we're all sort of charging in that direction as much as we can be, those of us who are really paying attention and working on it. And still, there is so much distance to go, it seems to me. Yeah. So I want to check in with Joy Shenla-Decker, candidate for mayor for the city of Santa Cruz. I believe you're a member of the Echo Socialist Working Group as well as part of DSA, Santa Cruz. Yeah. And so I know that we worked with DSA on the climate strike. So I have the sense that you are very aware of what's happening, which isn't just global heating, but is also mass extinction of species and and destruction of ecosystems, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is important to recognize because we've got all of this going on and Mm -hmm. we have to address it all. But your thoughts about... The reality and our current sort of political business yeah. mindset. Yeah, when Linda brought up that conversation, immediately I thought of the Lars von Trier film, Melancholia, from a few years ago, where, have you have any of you seen that film? What is that, when they're on a spaceship? No, they're no. on Earth, okay. spaceship Earth. Okay, and- <laughs> I saw one when they're on a spaceship trying to get off of Earth because it's is ruined. A, there is a, a huge meteor heading for earth and the the main character is she's she's feeling that things aren't quite right right everybody thinks she's insane yeah and you know they want to medicate her they want to control mm-hmm. her yeah um and i know you want to talk about feminism yes. and and environmental issues yes. and and so you know it's an interesting film because this woman is very sensitive to what's happening and everybody just thinks she needs to get over it and it be like, normal. It sounds like maybe that's what they modeled the film Don't Look Up on. Do you think that's... Cause maybe. It sounds there might be some kinship with it. I mean, okay. Melancholia is definitely very a very artsy film. But oh, okay. anyway, right. it just that cognitive dissonance and that feeling like we feel sometimes we have these conversations about how we don't want to be too negative. We don't right. want to scare people off. Right. Um, we want to be hopeful and productive and have pragmatic suggestions for concrete things that we can do here and now in Santa Cruz. We want the climate action plan and we want it to be concrete faster. Let's do this. Right. Um, But there is this cognitive dissonance when the weather is beautiful and most people are okay. I do think that we live in a culture in America and in Santa Cruz, this culture of inhabiting sort of first world and third world at the same time where where many of us are privileged enough to to be okay most of the time. Right. We've got food um, on the grocery yeah. store shelves still, farmer's market. But we do have a high rate of poverty and growing inequality even in our own city and county. And we have frontline communities that, that are experiencing the climate crisis yeah. and the economic crisis, the intersection of, of economic housing, climate, racial... Farm and workers, um, yeah, with pesticides. So and the heat, being yeah. working in the heat. Yeah, all sorts of things. And so, um, you know, that's happening here and now. And and I think indigenous activists say, you know, the climate crisis isn't in their future. The cli- the climate crisis has been happening to them since colonization and capitalism came to to the Americas. Right. You know, they've been experiencing the the apocalypse for 500 years. That's right. Devastation. Yeah. 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 The killing of all pandemics, multiple the buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I think it's very, very real. And I agree with Batya. Why? Happy talk. (laughs) Why would we build on the floodplain when we need to be creating carbon sinks? Right. So that (laughs) so that we can be sinking carbon into our land and allowing water to soak into our land. Why would we pave or or right. or Build densify all. in those in in the most sensitive 
areas. Habitats. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's, uh, and Bachi and Linda, I want you to know you can jump in at any time because we do have a bunch of us and I want mm-hmm. this to be sort of a discussion. People who would like to uh, text in, you can text in at 831-900-5773, 831-900-5773, or you can email on air at ksqd.org. That's on air at ksqd.org. Um, yeah, so here are some of the other tensions that we're dealing with citywide. Build, 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 baby, build. We want more housing, and the, there's this huge controversy with the YIMBY uh, organization, which we have a local group that represents YIMBY. And my problem here is that I don't hear about climate. If I do, it's about density, you know, infill building, um, putting everyone into the city so that they can take the bus. And that's great, but that's also kind of very future oriented. Like we're just going to slowly reduce the amount of driving we do by having this infill density housing, when in fact, we are at a point where we need to be rapidly decarbonizing, like 20 years ago. (laughs) But here we are. And so um, I wanted to, to quote some statistics about construction. According to research by the construction blog BIMHOW, the construction sector contributes to 23% of air pollution, 50% of climate climactic change, 40% of drinking water pollution, and 50% of landfill waste. In separate research by the U.S. Green Building Council, the construction industry accounts for 40% of worldwide energy usage, with estimates that by 2030 emissions from commercial buildings will grow by 1.8%. This was a few years ago. Mm. So um, uh, additionally, building materials such as concrete, aluminum, and steel are directly responsible for responsible for large quantities of CO2 emissions due to high contents of embodied energy content with 9.8 million tons of CO2 generated from the production of 76 million tons of finished concrete in the U.S., So (laughs) I can see Joy's kind of letting that sink in. And we have this pressure to, it kind of feels like, well, that, well, let's, well, this is our city. It's kind of like in your household, but we don't want to give up anything. We don't want to give up building, not just affordable housing, but market rate housing and lots of it, plus commercial developments. We want to keep pretending like this is not happening or that it's okay if the people in Somalia are starving to death. Comments, I'm going to go to Linda because she's on clean feed and sometimes I forget about those folks. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, and, and I just want to add, people are beginning to starve also in Nigeria. Okay. Um, and, um, it, and, it, and probably other places, many other places that we're not yet even aware of. Um, and I think my always my response when I think about this push to build more and more and more um, to accommodate the more and more people that we expect to be coming to Santa Cruz, um, I think about what can we possibly do to change our expectations about what is a good life and how much do you have to have in order for there to be a good life? Um, Do we need a 17 story hotel, for instance, in order to feel like Santa Cruz is at the front of the line in terms of being a tourist destination, for instance. Right. Um, Although I just I want to say I don't think that hotel will be 17 stories, but the there was a it's being floated to build 17 story uh, market rate plus some affordable housing developments south of Laurel, et cetera. Right. Sorry. Yes, that's right. So um, my, my concern always is, can we step behind all of that push for build, 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 and um, reimagine what a good life is in Santa Cruz? Uh, and, and really, that gets down to what's a good life in our, our communities, our neighborhoods. You know, it really um, has to, it's like a, a fractal. You keep looking smaller and you keep looking bigger and try to reproduce what is a good life. Um, what are the things that we could, quote, give up and still have 
a really good life. And I'm really hoping one of the things we could give up is the assumption that we have to keep growing exponentially and that that um, constitutes progress or only that um, gives us the good life. Yeah. And I think that there's a quote that just hit me. It always hits you the first time you hear it. You cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. And that is the economic system that we are living with and the co- sort of mass consumerism we're li- living with. Um, I'd like to go go to Joy to talk about the housing issue because she's been running for office. She's in the heat in the midst of this campaign. She understands how much pressure there is for affordable and market rate housing. Um, we don't I mean, that's an issue. People And Joy also has been working directly with people who are unhoused. She knows people by name. Uh, uh, A lot of the folks who just got cleared from the Benchlands, for example, she knows personally. Mm -hmm. So you understand the suffering that people live with living unhoused. And I know some some, of it. yeah, Yeah, some of it. Right, exactly. So tell me, I mean, we need affordable housing. Yes. What do we do? And then affordable housing costs money and, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, but developers are ready to go with their, you know, so what do you think? Well, first, uh, let me just respond quickly to the idea of degrowth. Um, I think that we have to have a nuanced conversation about growth and degrowth because I think what we've experienced for 40 years is austerity for regular people and, the growth that has happened has been basically the hoarding of wealth by a very small number of people, and they're mostly white men. And um, so I think what we need is degrowth for the ultra-rich and the very wealthy and a reversal of austerity for the majority of people on the planet. I mean, you know, I don't know exactly what all of our, in this room, all of our you know, economic resources are, were, I think, you know, in a global sense, privileged. Yes. Um, But when you compare us to the ultra rich, we're, you know, fairly modest, and we are not the largest consumers of, of fossil fuel driven stuff, you know, that's contributing to, to the global climate crisis. So, you know, I think that we all need to you know, we all need to do our part, but... Um, but going but, to city policies yes, and thank affordable you. housing... Yes, redirect me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... That's so a big question on I everyone's minds. I think it's, it's, it's similar. You know, we've had austerity for regular people, students, you know, lower paid workers, even like not, uh, you know, people who are like the bread and butter workers, uh, the, our teachers, our healthcare workers people who keep us safe and who keep our kids safe um who keep things running the uh, city it, employees yeah i mean yeah. they they and you know maybe we to an extent have experienced austerity for decades and a reduction in quality of life you know real wages going down inflation going up those aren't the people that need to degrow or you know tighten their belt like there are they people have already been tightening their belts so we don't need market rate housing or or like tiny sros Mm -hmm. for people to live in we need quality housing that's affordable for people and i think the whole paradigm of this penciling out of Mm -hmm. of building for the developers i I want us to collectively come up with ways to have things pencil out for the community. And I feel I feel confident that we can push back. Mm. And, you know, just because somebody's a nonprofit, it doesn't mean that there's no profits involved, right? Like, mm-hmm. so I'd like more transparency from all of our developers. And then when we have for-profit developers like Swenson Builders and other for-profit developers, why should they be extracting tens of millions of dollars out of our community? Mm-hmm. Why should we have management companies like Graystar, while well, they manage buildings and they own buildings, why should we have these international predatory corporations in our community that are extracting millions of dollars from our residents every year 
You know, like when one young person is paying $36,000 a year in rent for a one bedroom apartment and it's enriching an already rich global corporation, that's not okay. I know. <laughs> I'm listening to you and. I'm so glad you're running because I'm I, when I'm listening to Joy, I'm like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Bacha, do you want to share? We've got a few minutes before the break, and then we'll take a little break. Yeah, um, Joy, I love what you are saying. It's so to the heart of it. And, you know, if we can take that money back, you know, people are trying to do a public bank. Yes, for, yes, yes to public banking. Yes, for, for <laughs> California or just even for this mm-hmm. region. And, you know, if we can... Take that money back. Yeah. How much how much could be built? How much can be renovated? How much thought can be put into non concrete you were talking about yeah. concrete ideas, but I know you were just right. saying it. You were saying it <laughs> metaphorically, but I'm talking An- about anti concrete ideas. <laughs> anti concrete yes. ideas. Mm-hmm. Like what well, you know, the straw building, the rammed yeah. earth building. There's other ways to build besides yeah. a very energy Local intensive materials. right, besides an energy intensive way of building. And can we build thinking about the climate and maybe we have to not infill downtown, even though I know it makes the most sense energy wise. I get that it's, um, but we also have to think about the long term, seven yeah. generations ahead. Mm-hmm. The native people were on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, so thank you for putting that in. And I don't know how we reverse that trend, mm. but there is got to be a way. Yeah. And this is, yeah. uh, and I'm going to, we're just going to go to a break, but I just want to sort of point out that where we are with looking at, build, build, and build, and then where we want to go in a, in a more feminine way towards how do we really deeply respect natural right. systems and honor them where we are right. is sort of the disconnect that we're dealing mm-hmm. with. Yeah, uh, We're going to go to a break. You are on Talk of the Bay with Amy Chen Mills and mayoral candidate Joy Schenledecker, Bacha Kagan, uh, climate at lifelong climate activist, Linda Marin, also a lifelong climate activist. And after the break, I'm going to read Fred's statement because he gets to have a statement just like Joy did last week. And we'll be right back at you in about 60 seconds. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Talk of the Bay. Part two for this Thursday evening, we are with mayoral candidate Joy Schenledecker and two climate activists, Bacha Kagan and Linda Marin. Uh, And because we had Fred on last week and we read Joy's statement at that time, here is Fred's statement that he sent to me um, Tuesday. Fred Keeley is a longtime resident of our Santa Cruz community. Fred, a graduate of San Jose State University, began his public service career as an aide to then Assembly Member Sam Farr. Fred was elected to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors and served two four-year terms. As a county supervisor, Fred was the lead on transforming the local Medi-Cal health care program from a fee-for-service system to a Medi-Cal health maintenance program. This change increased access to quality health care for our lowest income families and their children. Fred was also our county's elected treasurer. This important fiscal position is responsible for investing public funds held by county government, school districts, and Cabrillo College. In that role, Fred was able to manage public funds in a way that resulted in a positive return on investments every month, even during the Great Recession. This was important because it provided much needed funds for public agency during the downturn of the economy. When Fred was elected three times to represent us in the California Assembly, he quickly became Speaker Pro Tem and served in that capacity for three Speakers of the Assembly. While representing us in the state capitol, Fred authored the two largest environmental protection bonds in California history. Fred also authored the package of bills that ended California's energy crisis. I know it's long, but so is yours. Mine was so (laughs) long. I'm really sorry. For four decades, Fred Keeley has had a 100% pro-choice voting record. As a county supervisor, Fred Keeley was awarded the Roe v. Wade Award for Dedication to Women's Reproductive Health. As a state legislator, Fred supported expansion of Medi-Cal Reproductive Services, which is still in place today. Fred has been endorsed by Planned Parenthood every time he has sought election, including this year. Fred Keeley is the pro-choice candidate for mayor. Planned Parenthood, the nation's most respected defender of women's of a woman's right to choose, evaluated both candidates and made a single endorsement for Fred Keeley because of his history of engagement and leadership on this most important issue, a woman's right to make their own reproductive decisions. Fred Keeley has also been endorsed by the Central Labor Council, UCSC College Dems, the California Democratic Party, the Santa Cruz County Democratic Women's Club, and many others. Fred Keeley is a pro-affordable housing, pro-union, pro-choice candidate for mayor. Fred did co- uh, respond to your uh, statement that I read, Joy, and so you're welcome to respond if you would like to to this one. 
Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's that's lovely. Fred has had a, a wonderful career, and he should be proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and so we're going to go back to our topic, which is the climate crisis and what can we do as a city? And we were talking about the disconnect between, I think maybe most of us on this show have read Starhawk's books, The Fifth Sacred Thing. Hell yeah. And um, Olivia Butler's Octavia books. Octavia Butler. Uh, I'm sorry, Octavia Butler's books about Parable of the Talents and Parable of the Sower. Yes. And Guidebooks. Yes. So mm-hmm. there's, uh, and then of course, uh, who was the woman who wrote The Handmaid's Tale? Margaret, Margaret Atwood. Atwood. Yes. Atwood. So there's something about these women. They seem prescient to me because what I see is that if we do not degrow somehow, it will happen to us. We will see collapse. And in fact, I just went to the, um, to the workshop with a couple of very interesting characters, one of whom is featured in the Ministry for the Future, Dr. Delton Chen, and also a woman named Della Duncan, who is with the Donut Economics of California Coalition. Delton Chen works with a global carbon reward system of economics. Um, both of them were talking about how much we need to shift our, our economics and rapidly. Um, and so... How does that, what does that look like here? What can we do in Santa Cruz here? I mean, I I think I feel like every city, unless they're pretty, very progressive, I would say, is probably like trying to ignore that we might need to be part of the solution because it is, it is such a leap. It is such a leap. But anyway, just to say, I'm just remembering now, um, yeah, they were saying that the leader of the central bank in the UK has recently said if we do not handle the climate crisis we will see a very swift collapse at some point of all markets across the world so i'm asking you do we want that to happen and be unprepared or do we want to be resilient and ready and doing doing our very best uh linda we haven't heard from you any (laughs) thoughts about what you think what would be a feminine response in the city? Mm. Well, first of all, your question, yes, of course we want to be resilient. That's, that's the choice that um, and any of us would make. Um, and a feminine choice in the city, hmm. <sighs> a feminine well, a, a climate a, response. Right, right. Well, one, one of the things, and I think this um, just... Uh, tags a bit uh, with what Batia said as well, which is that um, when we send our wealth, um, our resources, our money out of our city instead of um, preserving it and keeping it for the needs of our um, population, we uh, do such a disservice and we participate in you know, a very patriarchal system that we're all very used to and take as normal. But it is so important to keep our resources closed. So for instance, um, the city uh, government really could take its money out of um, banks which uh, support fossil fuel infrastructure and development, for instance. Yes. One of the, 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 the six big banks that do that. Yeah. Um, I think it's Wells no, Fargo, but we need to double check. It is Wells Fargo. It's Wells Fargo. Wells, and they're one Wells of the Fargo. top. They're, I think fuel. they're second or third largest investor in p- fossil fuels in all Correct. of all the banks. Yeah. And there's lots of other banks you can use. Uh, Bay Federal is a great one. Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. There's the local banks. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I think the issue for them is, does it have all the features and things that right. we need? And we are right. investigating it's scale. that. We're yeah. investigating yeah. that right now. It but, is. It is scale. Uh, um, but yeah, there, go but ahead. Now, there are banks now. At this point, there are banks of scale that um, could th- those funds could be redirected. So that's one of the things that I would say is would be um, a more holistic approach to taking care of ourselves uh, as a community. Um, and not participating in that system, which redirects 
um, our resources away from from us. And I think there's lots of other ways to uh, um, repeat that or replicate it um, too, not just money, but um, all, but we are talking economics as well. So you know, I would say, like for instance, um, when we were, we had a, a transition town, you know, kind of organization here in Santa Cruz, one of the things that I really appreciated was the effort to have um, an exchange of resources that didn't have anything to do with money. Like right? bartering, yeah. Yeah, like the, yeah. yeah, there is still a group that is Santa Cruz Time Bank, I believe. Um, the Time Bank, exactly. Yeah, and we may need that in the future. I'm telling you, if we have economic collapse, we are going to need to be organized that way. I believe we have a caller. Uh, and so, caller, what is your name and what is your question? Hi, my name is Cappy. Hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. Mm-hmm. Hi, Cappy. Um, Hi, Cappy. <laughs> Hi, Cappy. Hi, Batya, everybody. Um, my question is, uh, I feel like we don't have time to just deal with everything. We're up against it right now, as you've been bringing out. And uh, my main bottom line question, listening to you all, is there's only two ways to govern, either for people and communities or for money. And if we're going to be instead of a government of, by, and for the people, if we're going to be a government of, by, and for the corporation, that's a choice. And I think we have to make that choice. If we're going to stick with the corporation, we're going to go over the cliff like lemmings, following our our leader, the corporation. Right, right. It's not... It's, it's not a person. It's not going to stop. Right, gotcha. It's a system, really. So, Cappy, thank you so much. I'm going to take your comment to our guests and see what they have to say because okay. uh, thank you so much for your call. I think that we are, I think at a global level, a lot of us can say, oh my gosh, what some white people call runaway capitalism. Fred Keeley pointed out, well, China's doing the same thing, whatever you want to call it, it's extraction, manufacture, just constant sort of like plundering of the earth, right? We can see that globally, but when it comes to local, what does that, what does it mean to, you know, um, to stop supporting the corporations and and to support local people? What does it mean for our local economy? Because people need to work. And in Donut Economics, this woman was talking about, we can have an economy within the boundaries of natural systems. Mm-hmm. I don't even know practically what does that look like. Do we know? Go ahead, Joy. Well, in terms of governance, and and this is partly just because I'm sort of in it right now, and you were just in it, yes. we need campaign finance reform. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I would, would start with. I, I mean, um, Kathy, I agree with you, and that's one of the main reasons why I'm running for mayor is because I think we need people, not profits, and we need people in governance that are not accepting donations um, from real estate developers, um, lawyers, the, all the people that are associated with with the kind of development that is based on extraction of raw materials and um, exploitation of labor. Um, and yeah. Campaign yeah. finance reform. And then when we, you know, this is why we need unions. Mm-hmm. This is why we need to be encouraging worker-owned cooperatives in, in town. Like, mm-hmm. let's let's revitalize the downtown that we have and our other commercial corridors. And let's really encourage not just local businesses, but mm-hmm. worker-owned businesses, mm-hmm. cooperatives and, and collectives. Let's mm-hmm. move in that direction economically as well as socially. Okay. And uh, am I thinking about trees? For, you know, mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to be like, you know, and I said this to Fred, too. I said, we, we need to honor nature. We like there's, I think, a 2% increase in trees that yeah. is pr- pr- proposed by this climate action plan. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, let's go for 20. Let's go for 30. Let's go for 50%. <laughs> yeah. and, and let's have hey, urban farming and gardening. Mm-hmm. Let's ban pesticides in, yeah. for use in, in um, everywhere, yeah. not, yeah. you know, in especially in our 
our urban, we don't need to use pesticides in our no. gardens. Uh, we are losing butterflies. We are losing, losing insects. I just want to, this is, I think, important for people to know. Um, and I got to find the stats here. But we are currently living through a mass species extinction mm -hmm. event, the largest known. The speed with which mass extinction has onset appears to be the result of human activity. Scientists estimate that we are losing 10,000 times more species per year than the normal rate. A new study has suggested that insect populations have declined by 40% globally and one third are endangered. This is very alarming. Insects play a crucial role in pollinating plants and serve as the base of a food chain that animals and humans depend upon. A recent report finds that animal populations worldwide have declined by 70% over the last 50 years. Folks, we cannot mm. live without our brother and sister species here. Uh, and this is where I'm like, hello. You know, let's talk about this. This should be part of every policy that we put forward. Mm -hmm. We cannot live without species. So that means we need to protect ecosystems. And it it alarms me that this YIMBY housing thing is kind of like, screw that. Like, we just need to build housing. And I think we, we can't ignore one crisis for the sake of another crisis. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, we can't live. Like you said, we can't live without those other species. We think, we act as if... Everything that we need comes from a grocery store. It's not true. <laughs> right. It's not at all true. It right. gets to the grocery store because of all those species. Yeah. It won't be there for us. So one of the things I'm involved with is um, transitioning Watsonville. You know, in Watsonville, the Pajaro Valley has, speaking of big corporations, Driscoll's mm -hmm. is all over the Pajaro Valley. Mm -hmm. They they we've been pushing them this campaign for organic and regenerative agriculture is pushing to ask driscoll's to stop their pesticide spraying near s something reasonable near schools and near houses mm -hmm. i mean we eventually our dream is to turn the entire pajaro valley organic which is more than just like oh we don't want to stop we want to stop pesticides we want to stop it's the injustice of what happens to farm workers it's but it's also all the species that get killed by pesticides it's mm -hmm. all of the ground that it's that can't regenerate because it's completely chemical mm -hmm. instead of regenerative so if we ever are in a crisis we want that ground to be able to grow food yes. and we also can and we, and we, and we can make that into the dream is to make that into a beautiful um organic uh you know like kind of center where people from all around the world will want to come and see that yes. yeah we could become we could say we want to become the role model the donut eco economics people exactly. actually are looking for a city to like amsterdam yeah. right i mean in europe people are having these conversations at the municipal level and they are mm -hmm. alive and they're in the mainstream right. mm -hmm. and Amsterdam is like, we're going to go for a donut economy. We could do that here. And that's where I get frustrated because we always talk about, and I said this to Fred, I don't know if he agreed or not, but we say we're progressive. No, we're not. We, we need to be we're so much down. further mm -hmm. ahead than we are. Mm -hmm. And that's about survival. Our actions need to match our values and our yeah. words. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, we do have the climate action plan. There's uh, let's transition to electric heat and we're, we're not going to do gas anymore. And in fact, I'm already seeing pushback on next door from people who work with Santa Cruz together. Oh, my gosh, we can't cook properly if we don't have gas. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, my gosh, we're not going to be able to live, people. So that's why, you know, it's uh it's understandable. <laughs> I, I hate cooking with electricity myself. And we we need to think communally instead yes. of, I yes. mean, that <laughs> is, when you talk about changing how we think, yeah, we have to think communally. It is yes. not about, I want my, my stuff to cook on a gas stove. Right. It's about how are we going to care for everyone mm -hmm. here, not... Yeah. And and so this this whole mentality, if you talk about a feminine mentality, yeah. a feminist mentality, yeah. we're talking one that is communal oriented. Yeah. And not just me, 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 yeah. me. You are on and speaking uh, of that. Oh, hang on I? one second, just let me say okay. that you are on ninety point seven FM KSQD K Squid for the Santa Cruz area. Yes, Linda Marin, climate activist, extraordinaire. <laughs> um, <laughs> couldn't agree more with everything that you're saying. Um, and I and I am imagining that what if our city and county climate action plans um, 
instead of only having these, you know, transportation, electrification, wastewater, um, even wildfires, um, but uh, as categories that are planned um, for, what if there was um, an overarching category that had well-being mm-hmm. of the population? And mm-hmm. because that really does feel like if we had a, a lot metrics for measuring yes. well-being, yes. um, we would have a very different perspective because well-being would include all of those things like species. We need you. you yes, know? we need um, you. And, and, yeah. and, and, and fields and trees and streams and, trees. and rivers. We need you exactly. fish. We need yes. you in birds. We need you. Um, Joy, I want to give Joy a little time here as our candidate for mayor. I know that we can't come up with all these policy issue positions tonight, and that's not our job, but the orientation seems important. Mm-hmm. And that means moving away, I think, from this idea of endless growth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do want to say that in well, the well-being index in some countries mm-hmm. is a very important index in fact I'm, i can't remember the name there's one country that bhutan bhutan mm-hmm. is like this is how we measure mm-hmm. we don't measure gdp we measure gd gross, well-being mm-hmm. gross national <laughs> happiness is yeah. how gross they measure national yes. happiness and so let's i'm just like let's start because we don't have any other really honestly we have no other options i think a lot of people are actually a bit unhappy here yeah. In, in Santa Cruz, you think? <laughs> yeah, in some ways. <laughs> Wait, tell tell me more. Well, just, I mean, you mentioned Next Door and Santa Cruz together. We also have Santa Cruz neighbors. Yeah. And, you know, there's people that are unhappy about, mm-hmm. uh, on different, from different perspectives. Yeah. About inequality. Mm-hmm. Or some people go on anti-homeless rants. Yeah. Or, you know, there's, the, the They're people unhappy seem unhappy. They feel threatened about. by the, by yeah, what we, they think are rising crime rates. I've been looking at the crime rates. I'm not I so sure they're rising. We do want people to be happier. We yeah. want those people to be happier too. I don't want them to be unhappy. It's right. unpleasant for me. Well, and the interesting thing about the unhoused, for example, is I think that because we are psychically connected, mm-hmm. when we see people who are suffering, there are many w- places because we know we don't have much we can do individually necessarily. Maybe we could do more. I mean, I know someone who still let people shower at her house. Mm-hmm. Um, we could actually all do a little probably more, but you know, we, um, we have different reactions and I think the first reaction is compassion. And then that's so painful. Mm -hmm. that we go to anger or Mm -hmm. what's wrong with them or they did this to themselves. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm not saying that everyone who is unhoused is an angel. Everyone who is housed is not an angel. So, (laughs) but, um, and there's crime and there are issues. I don't think we need to ignore those, Uh, but go ahead. Yes. It's a little like our emotional reaction to the climate crisis that's upon us Mm -hmm. where, you know, we sometimes become so overwhelmed and grief is such a part of it individual grief but also a collective grieving you know as in groups or in community and i think that that it's true for climate it's also true for for our housing and houselessness crisis and i think sometimes people are like well here's something i think i can work on like housing Mm-hmm. And I can and I can be upset about it, but also push for more housing and more housing. Yeah. So I'm going to focus on this one issue. That's kind of what I see. Mm-hmm. And we will wait a second. I'm sorry to say this. I hate to say it. I'm so sorry. We have many crises. We and do. <laughs> they intersect. Yeah. So uh, yeah. so we if we're not going to have a dialogue about all these crises, then clearly we're not going to be okay in the end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, just something I want to read from this book called Degrowth that I'm reading, A Guide to a World Beyond Capitalism. Degrowth is a term that is increasingly mobilized by scholars and activists to criticize the hegemony of growth and a proposal for a radical reorganization of society that leads to a drastic reduction in the use of energy and resources and that is deemed necessary, desirable, and possible. Degrowth starts from the fact that, demonstrated by an increasing number of studies, the fr- that further economic growth in industrialized countries is unsustainable. I think that's very clear. Um, And then he he talks more about the global South um, and how, you know, they're suffering the worst impacts of our continual need to grow. Um, 
And uh, and any comments, Linda, because you're not, I can't see you. Do you have a comment? I just want to make sure that you get a, a, a chance to speak up. You know, I think that a dark side of all of this is... Uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a dark there's a side dark, there's another to the dark, dark side. side. Oh. Dark side to the dark side, yes. <laughs> is, is that um, when we think, for instance, of, of degrowth, and I so would, um, appreciated what Joy said about you know, there's um, a lot of us have um, been living austerity at the uh, expense of or, or to the benefit of the few, mostly white male um, run corporations and people. I'm going to add um, in, look, I'm half Chinese, so I get to do this. We, we, maybe Chinese men too. We've got a huge yeah, economy over be. there. Yep. <laughs> and other, possibly other men, Indian men, who knows? Sure. I think every culture has its patriarchs. Yeah. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. But, so, the, but it's back just to the, the riches dark of side. the rich. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Right. Um, is this that um, I, I think what, what we, what, pushes us internally, each of us individually, is some degree of knowing that whatever degree of privilege each of us experiences, it is at the cost of all kinds of other terrible pain. Um, you know, whether it's um, that, you know, we keep eating fish that are now, you know, hardly have a chance to um, reproduce or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, that we're choosing, and then all kinds of other ways in which we can't even make connect all the dots, like you know the people starving, beginning to starve in Nigeria. Well, they didn't just begin to starve in Nigeria. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons um, that we have impacted their life and their children. But I want, I want to, I do want to jump in here because Michael and I talked about this on the last show about this on this topic. Is I think that people feel so overwhelmed, and we're in such a system you know, that involves commuting and driving and heating our homes. And, and, and we don't, the Extinction Rebellion motto was like, you know, no blame, no shame, meaning let's do the best we can individually, but really the governments need to c control the fishing. I mean, we can't, you know, people don't even know what fish to eat or not eat or mm -hmm. haven't watched the documentaries about the fish. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, we can't do this on our own as individuals. We need to push our governments to organize things. Military industrial complex. The military industrial complex, yes. L largest polluter in the world and yeah. largest producer of toxicity in the world. But yeah. what, what, the, what that means, Amy, and I really wanted to get a chance to say this, is that being an activist... I know is not doesn't appeal to everyone, but it actually is fun and it's actually exciting. And you get to be with the best of the mm -hmm. best people who are doing what they do because they care about the whole community. And our happiness doesn't come from our stuff, even though we've been trained and it's not our fault. We've been trained to think, well, more stuff, more happiness, more stuff, more happiness. No, it doesn't actually work that way. It's actually almost the opposite. When when we had that crisis of of the earthquake or even the fires, there's it's it's a terrible disaster, and mm. people come together mm -hmm. and they care about each other and they see each other for the first time and they know I depend on you and you mm -hmm. depend on me and we're in this together. Yeah. But otherwise, our stuff separates us. You have your own mm -hmm. washing machine, I have mine. We don't talk to each other. So what I'm trying to say is, we need to come together both both as a community and in order to get this changed, the, those upper echelon people are not going to give up their power no. without a lot of pressure. So come together, folks. <laughs> come to the Center for Farmworker Families and join mm -hmm. me and other people, farmworkerfamily.org, in changing the Pajaro Valley over to organic. Or come with me, with others of us that are joining um, to start to get the city to change its money from Wells Fargo to a place that isn't buying into fossil fuels. So novasutras.org forward slash Santa Cruz, climate justice action. Please join us. Well, and also uh, we could ask the city to uh, make a resolution to get CalPERS to divest from fossil Absolutely. fuels. That would be huge. Huge. Um, I just want to do this quick read and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, yeah. From an article in uh, Earth Island Journal uh, that cities, 
could have a reciprocal relationship with living systems within and beyond their reaches, returning materials and forms that would allow those systems to reabsorb and regenerate as well. They could rely on locally or regionally sourced food and energy and be a natural refuge for plants and animals. Um, Cities occupy less than 4% of Earth's land surface, but they are resource gobbling behemoths. Uh, what the most damage we do is outside of our cities, actually. So when we talk about corridors and transportation, we're not thinking about what's happening when we're mining for cement and, you know, steel and all these things. Um, key challenges are related to implementing ecologically sound infill development. So there's that more energy efficient homes, urban farms, water harvesting systems, and solar power. Uh, anyway, there are a lot of ideas I think that we should all be thinking carefully as we're thinking about who to elect as well, because people who are elected get to allocate resources. I want to thank my wonderful guests on this show about climate change and urban policy and Santa Cruz policy with Joy Schenledecker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, Bacha Joy. Kagan, thank you so much, climate yeah. activist. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. And Linda Marin, thank you so much, also a climate activist. I just really appreciate your time.